Hi everyone, welcome to episode 6 of Front End Center. Today we're looking at code design and refactoring, and how we can build better React components by borrowing a few ideas from object-oriented programming principles. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Lookahead for supporting this episode. The functional programming aspects of React are fairly prominent. By making your UI a pure function of your application state, you remove a whole class of bugs that plagued earlier frameworks. If you look closely at the render method or performance optimizations like should component update, as well as popular libraries like Redux, again you'll see a strong functional programming influence. But that's not the only thing at play. Because component-driven design is actually much closer to object-oriented programming. Components encapsulate state, present a public API, and map to objects in the real world, or in our case the UI, which are all core properties of objects in OO. And they relate to each other. They share information or depend upon each other, which are all classical OO design problems. It means there's a wealth of ideas, discussions, and patterns that we can bring to bear in making our React components more readable, reusable, and maintainable. Now, if you're not using React, the good news is that component-driven development has become pretty dominant across the front-end landscape, and so a lot of these ideas will be directly applicable regardless of what framework you're using now or in the future. Today I'm going to focus on the single responsibility principle, and how it can guide you to making better components. There are lots of different OO principles, and I'll come back to a few of them at the end, but I wanted to start with this one because it's one of the simplest and most widely applicable ideas. It's defined as this. A class, or in our case a component, should have one and only one reason to change. I really like this definition because it's so unambiguous. There are lots of ways to argue whether a component has more than one responsibility, but by putting it in terms of change, you have a precise point where you can evaluate things. As you're working on a project, you can keep an eye on which files you have to keep revisiting and which components seem to always need editing, and that gives you a clue to dig deeper and refactor things. The other nice thing is that you can apply the thinking behind this principle almost anywhere. You can apply it to functions, CSS files, packages on NPM, basically whatever the logical unit is for some part of your application. Before I talk any more about theory, let's look at this principle in practice. Consider a component representing your hand in a card game. You click a button to fetch your hand, you see a spinner while it's loading, and then your cards appear. If you click it again, the spinner reappears and you get dealt a new hand. All this is handled by the hand component. If you'd like to pause and read through the code, it's online here, but I'll point out the main pieces. We have a render method that changes what's displayed depending on the state. If we have cards, we render them, otherwise we render placeholders. If we're loading, then we show a spinner image over the top, otherwise we show a button to get more cards. Our render methods for the cards and placeholders are all pretty simple. In the case where we have cards, we simply inject images, otherwise we generate five placeholder card divs. When we click the button, we call a method on our component, which first sets the state as loading, then fetches a new deck of cards from the API, then deals five cards from the deck, and sets the state again. It's all pretty straightforward, and as a starting point, it's actually quite good. But let's look at how we might want to refactor this component as it grows to take on more responsibility. Your instincts might tell you to break this fetch call into its own module or a series of actions, since it has the remote URLs hard-coded and it's the only thing so far that hits the network. Or, you might want to clean up the render method, breaking out these little chunks of markup into their own method so it reads a bit better. Or maybe you've spotted something else you'd like to address. All of these are valid changes you could make, but how do you decide which one to prioritize? This is why I like the single responsibility principle so much. By asking yourself what is likely to change about this component, we can start to understand where to direct our attention. In my experience, changes usually fall into a couple of categories, with different strategies for mitigating them. First, there's cosmetic changes, which could be simple tweaks to spacing or colors, or changing animation timings, or reordering content, etc. The best way to handle these is to have a solid CSS architecture, because these have to do with how components look in relation to one another as much as how a component looks in isolation. I'm going to be focusing more on the JavaScript side of things today, but I'll be doing episodes on CSS architecture in the future. Another common change is when a component needs to do something it previously couldn't. This could be a new user-facing feature or simply using a component in a place that it wasn't designed for. These can be difficult when they contradict one of our assumptions about what a component can do and how it can be used, and so we'll look briefly at how to recognize when we're leaving ourselves a potential problem. Some of the most difficult changes have to do with performance optimization, because these can reveal structural problems with what we've built. Working on the web, performance is a crucial part of delivering good quality results, and yet it's not always clear where the problems will arise. 
And so it's difficult, and maybe even unwise, to put too much focus on performance at the beginning of a project, but you can make sure you don't back yourself into a corner. Finally, there's external changes, when something outside your app changes and needs to be reflected within your code. That could be something like the URL of a service you're using, a particular response format for an endpoint, a dependency with a crucial security update, but it could even be business-related things like how many languages your product supports. You generally can't do much to predict these changes, but you can design your app to be resilient to them. These come up at different times in a project's lifecycle and will differ dramatically from project to project. And they'll affect different components in different ways, but it's still useful to try to anticipate the kinds of changes that might occur, even while you're fixing something else. Let's see an example. I'm going to show that we have a pretty bad performance bug in what we've already written, so let's go and fix it. When we replace our hand, we get a set of five new cards that fade in from left to right. But this isn't going to work very well in production, the way we've built it, because each of these images will take some time to load, and we're not preloading them in any way. Let's simulate a new user on a 3G connection so we can see the problem clearly. It's not so good. We didn't notice the problem earlier because we're serving these images locally, but in production, this isn't going to work. Let's look at how to fix it. The problem is this line. We're rendering tags into the document for images the browser hasn't loaded yet and trying to fade them in while the browser is still fetching them. We need a way of rendering these images that gives us a bit more control over the result. There are a couple of ways we can tackle this, but a good option when you have lots of individual images is to use a sprite sheet. I have a single image here with every card placed side by side in full resolution. It means that if we can use this image to render all the cards in our UI, we only have to wait for this one file to load. But where should we make this change? It's definitely going to require modifying this line of code, and we could implement it here. But if we look around this file, we see that this component has a lot of stuff that won't need a change right now. And that's the signal for us to consider this file for refactoring. I think the trick to making this approach work is to do the refactoring before you try to make the change. It's much easier to improve your code when you have a clear task in front of you, whereas it can be pretty difficult to go back to a file that you've already made a mess in and figure out how to clean it up. So let's break this line out into its own component. I'm going to grab the single image tag rather than this whole render method because it's the smallest possible piece that can contain the new logic, which is usually a good heuristic. I'm going to use a stateless functional component here, which I tend to use a lot. They're really good for encapsulating markup in this way. The function has a really clear signature too. It takes a single property, which is the card, and returns a single image tag in response. Because this function only has one statement, we're using round brackets here. It means we don't need a return statement, but also prevents us from declaring variables, which is a nice way of keeping these functions simple. Let's add it back into our component and make sure it still works. Yep, it's still working, so let's go and make the change. We're not going to be using image tags anymore, so let's just replace them with divs. We also don't need the key or source tags anymore. We'll be doing all this with CSS. Our cards have disappeared, but our divs are still there. So let's give them the background of our image sprite. We also need to tell the browser how big this image is, because it's a lot bigger than the space in which it's drawn. Since it's 52 cards wide and one card tall, we can set this to 5200 by 100%. Now this is a big image, and so it does still take a few seconds to load, but once it's done, we don't have to worry about this anymore. And it's a lot easier to preload a single image than 52 separate ones. To make the card display the right image, we just have to change the position of the background to some offset calculated from the card. Here's one I've prepared earlier, which looks at the suit and the value of the card and figures out where it is in the sequence of the sprite. Then it calculates the background position CSS string we need. If you haven't worked with sprites like this before, don't worry, the code for each episode of Front and Center is always posted online for you to poke through and understand it better. As we hoped, our cards are fading in left to right just fine. We could now go further and preload the sprite image, but let's call this change done for now. If you look at this file, it's really nice and self-contained. It's a component with one prop, a card, and one job to do, to render a div with the exact right background offset for the spriting to work. Single responsibility components like this aren't necessarily super simple, it's just that their complexity is all related to one thing. If we go back to our hand component, we can start to anticipate more changes that might occur. 
We might have an external change where the URL of the API or the response changes, so we could break this out into a helper method somewhere so it's isolated. Or we might present our cards in a different way, maybe changing how big they are or stacking them on top of each other. This would affect both the cards and the placeholders, and so that gives us a clue that maybe they should be broken out into a new component. But the biggest imminent change is that this component doesn't really do very much at the moment, and if this is the beginning of some kind of card game, then there's going to be some significant changes to the interactions that this hand component has to support. But how do you prepare for that change if you don't know what it's going to be? The answer is to break the pieces you are sure about away from the pieces that are still nebulous. In other words, by preparing for the changes you know about, you inadvertently prepare for changes that are sprung upon you. So let's make those two small changes and then look at the component we have left. Let's grab these fetch statements and replace them with a call to some API object. We'll pass the number of cards we want as a parameter because that's really our component's concern, not the API's. Let's create that method and paste in the code. Now, I'm following my own rule here, which is to try to focus on only one thing at a time. So while I could refactor this method further, my main focus is just getting it out of the hand component. Then we just need to import our new function and we should be done. Yep, it looks like it's still working fine. Finally, let's break out these random methods as well. Again, I'm just trying to move them, not change how they work. Now these were class methods previously, so I need to at least convert them to top-level functions to be valid syntax. I also want to move a couple of things to be parameters. For instance, the number of placeholders to draw, as well as anything that previously used this dot state. Now let's just move the markup across as well and wire everything up. Note, we have to pass in the information now, the cards array and the number of placeholders we want. Here we can create a simple markup only component and call our two render methods. The last step is just to wire up all the imports and we should be good to go. Yep, everything's working fine. We haven't changed anything user-facing, but we've left ourselves a hand component that's much more reasonable. It's now almost solely concerned with how the state of the hand gets manipulated and passed down to the rendering components. We could go one step further and break out all the markup from this component, but that depends on the level of uncertainty about what might change. As it stands, I expect a lot of this markup to change when the new logic is added, so I think it's fine to all keep here for now. And that's how I see the single responsibility principle applying to React components. It's an idea I've been applying to my own work and it seems particularly well suited to UI problems. But it's not the only object-oriented programming principle that's relevant. Because single responsibility is just the first of the solid principles, and they themselves are just one set among many. In the next episode, I'll dig deeper into this, in particular how the concept of Liskov substitution is relevant for designing building block components that need to be reused in a variety of unpredictable ways. Thanks for watching. Just quickly before you go, I'd like to thank Look Ahead again for making this episode available. They hire software engineers and CTOs in Australia and are particularly involved in the JavaScript and React communities. They're a small team and I've known them all for years. They're literally the only tech recruiters in Australia I'd recommend and I can't recommend them highly enough. If you're new to the channel, Front End Center is a subscription screencast series for web professionals. Thanks to supporters like Look Ahead, there are now five videos available here free on YouTube. If you'd like to support the channel and see the full collection, including the sequel to this episode, head over to frontend.center and subscribe. Or subscribe here on YouTube to get notified whenever more free episodes are released. Thanks for watching.